the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. On this day, brothers and sisters, we celebrate the Kizan icon of the Mother of God and the miraculous deliverance that she effected for the city of Moscow in the year 1612, delivering her from the hands of Polish invaders. And on this day, as with all feasts of the Mother of God, we hear these certain readings from the New Testament. The conjoined reading from the Gospel of Luke, from taken from chapters 10 and 11, and the reading from St. Paul's Epistle to the Philippians, chapter 2. And I must confess that every feast of the Mother of God, when I hear these readings, specifically the reading from the Gospel, there's something that bothers me. It is not the fact that the first portion of the reading has actually nothing to do with the Mother of God directly. It speaks of Martha and Mary, the two sisters of Lazarus, who entertain Christ in their house, and how Martha is busy about the work of making dinner and setting the table and tidying up and making sure the napkins are folded right and the right fork is in the right place and the right glass is in the right spot and the wine is prepared and all of these things as Martha sits at the feet of the Lord and hears his teaching. Because this is clearly an example of what Mary the Theotokos did as well that she did not busy herself about so many things in this life, but rather heard the word of God and obeyed it. That's not what bothers me. It's rather the second portion of the reading, the bit that comes from Luke 11, verses 27 to 28. And because of the bit that bothered me, I took it upon myself to do something that I've never done before. This morning before the Divine Liturgy, I asked the deacon to cross something out in the gospel book and to correct it because it was an improper translation. Let me read to you what you typically hear from these two verses. And while Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The King James Version that our gospel is based off of, and many English translations influenced by this, have rendered the phrase that Christ says to seem that he is contradicting the woman. That when she said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nursed you, he said, Oh, no, 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 that's nothing. On the contrary, you should really be concerned about the people that hear the word of God and keep it. But this is a misrepresentation of what Christ actually said and of what the Greek of the New Testament actually says. For elsewhere in the, in the Greek New Testament, this, exa- this exact same Greek term that gets translated here as either rather or on the contrary or instead I say is instead translated Yes, indeed. Or, you thought that was something, let me tell you something even more. I will take what you've said to the next step. So St. Paul, for example, in his letter to the Church of Rome, was discussing the relationship between Israel and the Gentiles, and how all of Israel had heard the word of God, had heard the gospel, and his hope that all would eventually receive, all true Israel would receive the gospel and come to Christ. And he says in the midst of this, he raises a rhetorical question. Have they all heard the proclamation of the gospel? And he uses the exact same Greek word here. Yes, indeed, for the prophet has said, my word has gone throughout all the nations. And he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. Or elsewhere, in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, in describing to his listeners 
all of the things that he once thought were of a benefit to him from his Jewish identity, his circumcision on the eighth day, his being of the pure blood of the tribe of Benjamin, which had boasted itself as the first royal lineage. Saul had come from his tribal line. How he had been a Pharisee and of the strictest order of the Pharisee, keeping the law day and night without uh, breaking it in any bit. He then goes on to say, but when Christ came and I saw who he was, I considered all of those things that I once thought were to the benefit of my salvation as a loss, as nothing. And he says, yes, and more than that. Or if you think that he says, uh, he goes even further and says, without a doubt, those things were nothing of no benefit to me. That same Greek word is translated there. Without a doubt, he's taking what he said to the next step, not contradicting what he said before, but intensifying it. And so too here in the gospel, we often hear this. And again, we hear it through the lens of a translation that has come to us from the height of the Protestant Reformation, when there was a lot of debate going on between the Catholics and the Protestants about the place of Mary in the Christian tradition. And because of this, it seems to have colored the translators. They have inserted a rendering that seems to imply that Jesus is saying, don't worry about the woman that, uh, whose womb bore me and whose uh, breast nursed me. Instead, be concerned with those who keep the word of God, hear the word of God and keep it. But what if we take the meaning that we found from these other passages and insert it here? What is Christ really saying? The woman is trying to bless the Theotokos for the mere fact that she gave birth to him and raised him. And he says, yes, that's true. But even more than that, blessed is the one who hears the word of God and keeps it. He's not contradicting her. He's focusing in on what was truly blessed about the mother of God. Because who more than she heard the word of God and kept it. Imagine if she had not sat at the feet of the Lord for all those years of growing up in the temple, hearing the law and the prophets read, and that forming and shaping in her the desire to be, as St. Gregory Palamas tells us, she wanted only to be the handmaiden of the mother of the Messiah. What if she had been worried about all the things that all the other teenage girls were at the time? What if when the holy archangel Gabriel came into her house and said, Rejoice, thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee, and began to explain to her that she would bear the Christ child, she said, Oh, 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 I've got an education to get. I've got a dinner party to plan tonight. I've got to clean the room. Can you come back next week? I have a couple things on my schedule right now. What did she say? She put up no opposition. She marveled at the possibility that this could happen because she had vowed to consecrate herself to virginity. And so she asked how this was possible, but she put no obstacle up. Instead, she said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be to, the, to me as you have said. She embodies for us the blessed state that Christ is speaking about today. For she, more than any, heard the word of God and kept it. But because Christ also puts this, uh, this, this turn on the blessedness here, it opens something up for us as well. None of us can be the Theotokos. None of us can bear Christ into this world as she did. That is a one-time singularity in history. But each and every one of you can enter into that second blessed state. Each and every one of you can hear the word of God and keep it. And if you do, earth around us, look out. Because what happened when the mother of God kept the word of God that she had heard. What happened? We hear this proclaimed in some of the hymns from our service last night, from Vespers. From the Vespers service last night, we heard the following. Bowing down the heavens, the king of glory condescended to restore Adam, who had become corrupt through transgression. 
He made his abode within thee, O pure virgin. He was born without violating the seal of thy virginity, and through, and though king of the archangels, he was born in thine arms as a lowly babe. And now he anticipates thine entreaty and fulfills thy petition in all things, in that he is thy son and God. Therefore beseech him earnestly that he save our souls, in that he is compassionate." The very Lord who sought to restore Adam and Eve who had first fallen into sin does so by condescending and coming to be born of the mother of God because she heard the word of God and kept it. He attracts the grace to her, she attracts the grace to herself and becomes the means of the incarnation. Also it said, more than the tabernacle of Moses, which was fashioned according to a heavenly plan, did God halo thee, O holy with the Holy Spirit, O Theotokos. Having dwelt holy within thee, he has given life to all men. Wherefore thine icon also has been filled with the grace of God more than the ark of Aaron, and pours forth sanctification upon souls and bodies, and bowing down with love before it, we ask of thee great mercy, that our souls might be saved, O blessed helper. You see here, the hymnographer is drawing on all sorts of images from the Old Testament to try and explain to us the atomic energy of salvation that radiates forth from the mother of God because she heard the word of God and kept it. And so he starts all the way back at the fall, when our first parents, turning from God, seeking to grasp divinity and immortality from themsel for themselves by taking the fruit by the deception of the serpent, separated themselves from God. And instead of hearing a mere word of punishment that would come upon them, they heard a word of hope. Because then God said to Eve that your seed will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And she longed for the day that the child that would come from her womb or from her lineage would come to put things back to right, to restore mankind to paradise, to restore him to his relationship with God. And so when they were sent out from the garden, when she bore her first son, she named him Cain. And if you don't know Hebrew, you don't know the significance of what she was trying to do when she named him such. She proclaims, I have begotten a son by the Lord. It should be, I have begotten a son by the Lord, exclamation point. Because she hopes that this child that she has just given birth to is the seed that was promised to her. But unfortunately, that son rises against his other brother in fratricide and, and marks himself as the seed of sin, not the seed that will bring life. But as time would go on, the woman would come who would undo the knot of Eve, as St. Irenaeus says. As the Theotokos heard the word of the angel, like Eve heard the word of the serpent, and instead of uh, setting herself up in her own self-will, as Eve had when she heard the word of the serpent, she submits herself to God. She undoes the knot of Eve, and in so doing, her seed is the seed that crushes the head of the serpent because she heard the word of God and kept it. Or as the hymnographer went on to describe how Moses was on Mount Sinai. And if you go back and read the book of Exodus, you do yourself a good favor to do so. When Moses led the people out of Egypt, he took them to Mount Sinai so they could hear the word of God. And God told them to prepare themselves for three days to keep a fast to keep themselves from their relations with their spouses, to prepare and cleanse themselves so they could see and hear the word of God coming from the mountain. And as they approached Mount Sinai, God descended upon it. And Moses is at a loss for words to explain what it is they experienced. He, saw, he uses language that there was an earthquake that shook the mountain. Fire produced from the mountain like a volcanic eruption. Lightning was seen in the sky. It was dark and light at the same time. There was noise and a whirlwind. When God appears, it is overwhelming to mankind. And when God begins to speak and he pronounces first the Ten Commandments, the people are so overwhelmed, they say, Moses, we want nothing to do with it. You go talk to him and tell us what he has to say. They're terrified. 
Well, that same presence that came upon Mount Sinai that day that was so overwhelming that no one was able to stand in its midst or to bear to hear it, that dwelt within the womb of the Theotokos because she heard the word of God and kept it. And that same presence that they trembled before, they were unable to see. And when Moses went up into the midst and spoke to God and came down, he himself was transfigured. His face radiated with glory and the people couldn't even bear to look upon him. They were terrified. That was in the womb of the mother of God because she heard the word of God and kept it. Or the hymnographer goes on to liken the Theotokos to the tabernacle. Because God wanted to dwell in the midst of his people. And he realized that they could not bear his unmediated presence. And so he had them construct a threefold tabernacle for him. On which our churches are still modeled to this day. And he dwelt in the Holy of Holies. And the priests would enter into the, into the inner court, the holy place, every day to offer incense before him. And the people as a whole could enter into the outer court to offer their sacrifices. And when Moses first built this tabernacle, which was not something he just conjured up in his mind, but rather was a heavenly uh, paradigm, a blueprint, as it were, that he received from God. He saw in advance in prophecy the image of Christ and translated it into a structure so that the people could come into the presence of God. When he did this, they prayed for it to be consecrated and the Holy Spirit came down upon the temple or the tabernacle, the glory of God dwelt within the tabernacle such that the priests could not even enter. It was like a smoke that was so thick they couldn't even walk through it. That same presence was in the womb of the mother of God because she heard the word of God and kept it. And finally, she is likened to the ark the ark that bore within it the uh, symbols of the old covenant, the law, the two tablets of the law, the manna that had come down and fed the people in the wilderness, the rod of Aaron that had budded, these various symbols of God's deliverance. And it was the very throne of God in the tabernacle. In many of the ancient temples of the ancient Near East, the peoples who worshipped the various gods, they saw the temples as the house of their god. So when you went into the inner court, it was not an empty room, it was the sitting room of the god. And a statue of the god was to be found there. Not so in the tabernacle. Because God would not be limited to some image of a creature. And so there in the central place of the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant. And God's presence would rest above it. It was his throne. That presence that only the great high priest of the Old Testament once a year was allowed to enter into to, on the Day of Atonement to sanctify that place so that God would stay in their midst. That same presence rested in the womb of the mother of God and is why the mother of God is depicted often as she is behind the altar here, enthroned with Christ sitting in her lap. Because she is the new throne of God. And the Ark of the Covenant, when it was moved from place to place, was so holy that they could not touch it. It had to be carried on poles. And once when they were not following the instructions, they put it on an ox cart. And it began to tip over. And one of the Israelites, pious as he might have been, made the foolish mistake of thinking that his hand was more holy than the dirt that the thing was about to fall on. And he tried to interpose himself to catch the ark of God, and he was struck dead for daring, deigning to touch the holy ark of God. That's what bore, was born in the mother of God. Or when it was brought to Jerusalem before the construction of the temple by King David, it says in the book of Saul, Samuel that David rejoiced and offered sacrifice after sacrifice in the presence of God, and he danced and whirled with all his might for joy before the presence of God in the, in the Ark of the Covenant. So too, the mother of God, because she heard the word of God and kept it, became the true Ark of God. And when she went to see her cousin Elizabeth, what did the holy prophet John the Baptist do in the womb of his mother? He danced and whirled with all his might for joy because the true ark was now in his midst. 
So you see what happens when you hear the word of God and keep it? You see what happens? Things happen. Things change. You have the opportunity to become not the Theotokos. As I said, that's a singularity. But you have an opportunity to become a vehicle by which God will bring his life-giving power and salvation into this world. So as you hear that word then today, rejoice in the mother of God for all that she has done. She has sought out each and every one of you for your salvation. We marvel at the many things she has done in the past through the inter her intercessions to Christ. And we know through this that we can pray to her as well and hope that she will do what is necessary for our salvation. But you know what she is praying for the most? She is praying that each and every one of you will follow in her footsteps. That you will sit at the feet of Christ, even if only for a little bit each day. Even if you can only give up Sundays and put aside the cares of the Marthas of this world for a little while and be merry at his feet to hear his word, to let it take root in your heart and to keep it, to obey it, to put it into practice. And if you do so, the world around us, look out. Because if this is what happened when the mother of God heard the word of God and kept it, what will happen when each and every one of you do as well? Most Holy Theotokos, save us.